Well, welcome once again to our online worship service. I'm Don Ebert. I'm the lead pastor here at the Wadsworth United Methodist Church. And if you are joining us for the very first time, a very special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us for worship. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We're going to be honoring uh, fathers a little bit later uh, in our service. Doug uh, has some interesting facts about Father's Day as a part of his message. So I think we have another wonderful service planned again for you uh, this Sunday. We're in the middle of a sermon series, Stuff My Church Does and Why. And this morning we're going to talk about why we study, why we read God's Word. Why is God's Word so important to us as the people of God? And our first song uh, reflects some of that truth. We've sang it before. It's entitled Ancient Words. But before we go there, uh, let's... Open with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this day uh, that you have made. We thank you for the honor and privilege of gathering together as your people to worship you. Uh, Just pray that you bless us as we praise and worship you. We gather and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together ancient words. Long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope, they give us strength, help us. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the Ancient words in heart. Holy words of our faith handed down to this end came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of pride. Oh, he words long preserved for our war in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient I just love that song, and I think you'll see in just a few moments uh, that it's appropriate to uh, this uh, Sunday's uh, message. 
I want to point out just a couple of announcements for you in your bulletin. Again, your bulletin is available for viewing and download from our church website. But I guess the biggest announcement is that our in-person worship uh, begins next Sunday, June 28th, uh, just one service at 10 a.m. Uh, we will be continuing to offer our online worship service uh, via our YouTube channel for those of you who aren't able to attend our in-person worship. So that will be premiering uh, each Sunday uh, for the time being at 10 a.m. also. But uh, letters went out uh, concerning the guidelines uh, about our in-person worship. So hopefully you received those letters. Uh, If you didn't, uh, you can access those from our church website. Uh, But I think we've done a very a uh, good job of providing a, a safe setting for our in-person worship. So I uh, hope to see some of you um, next Sunday. We did put together a, gro- a Google survey, just a couple questions. I think there's four maybe about what some of your intentions are uh, for next Sunday, whether you will be attending uh, our in-person worship service next Sunday or in the future. And so please be sure to uh, to uh, do that survey, uh, we value your information uh, very much. Um, let's see, Vacation Bible School, our virtual Vacation Bible School, that starts up this coming Monday, tomorrow, uh, June 22nd. Doug Meek has a lot more to say about that in just a few moments, but there's a lot of information in your bulletin and on the website about our virtual Vacation Bible School. Our mission trip is still planning to go to Whiteville, North Carolina. Uh, the week of July 19th through the 25th. Jeff Chester is the the contact person. So there are several other announcements in your bulletin, so please be sure to to look at those. I just want to recognize our altar flowers this morning. They are dedicated to the glory of God and in honor of the marriage of Amanda Davies and Johnny Toombs. So congratulations, Amanda and Johnny. At this time, our praise band is going to lead us in the singing of Great Are You, Lord. Let's give praise to our God this morning.
life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills. Yay, traffic. Woohoo, taxes. Yes, laundry. Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason, texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. Good morning, children, your families, all the members of our church family, and any guests that have joined us today. So good to worship together this morning. Good to see you. Well, I hope you're all ready. Something really exciting is happening tomorrow. Tomorrow's the first day of our Bolt Virtual Vacation Bible School. We're going to have so much fun with games and songs and crafts and Bible stories. We're going to be learning this week what it means to focus on Jesus to follow Jesus, and to listen to Jesus. And it's going to be lots of fun. So that'll be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then Thursday night, this coming Thursday night, at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a Zoom gathering. Everyone that's from our church and community that's doing Bible school through Bold is going to gather uh, through Zoom, and I'll send out the information about that. I've been wanting to see your faces and talk to you, and I thought it'd be fun to play some games online with you and sing some songs, and then we'll talk about what we've been learning this week at VBS. And so ho hope you're uh, going to tune in for that as well. Just a word to parents and grandparents, if you haven't already done so, please go to the Bolt Vacation Bible School page. You can access that through our church's website. There you'll find the uh, parent and leader guide that you can read. It's brief, but just read that over beforehand. There are a few items you need to gather uh, to get ready, and then uh, on Monday, tomorrow, just whatever time you want to do it. Could be morning, could be afternoon, could be evening. You can go to that page and click on day one video and watch and pause it when it asks you to do something or, or do an activity. So it's going to be so much fun. If you have any questions about that, just give me a call. I'm looking forward to a great week at Bolt Virtual Vacation Bible School. Well, let me say Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers and grandfathers, all of our foster fathers, and those men in our lives that are like foster or that are like fathers to us. And we want to celebrate today and you and thank you for all that you do. In fact, I've brought along something, something special, boys and girls, that I wanted to show you today on this Father's Day. Would you like to see it? All right, let me grab it here. Here it is. Do you know what this is? This is a penguin, you're right. Now you might be thinking, what do penguins have to do with Father's Day? Well, I've been reading about father penguins and what they do to help care for their family. Now father penguins have a very important job. When the mother penguin lays an egg, it's the father penguin's job and responsibility to take care of that egg, to keep it warm and keep it safe until it hatches. And so what uh, father penguin will do once the egg has been laid, the father penguin will walk up to it and stand over it and gently slide his feet under the egg. And he balances the egg on top of his feet. He 
because he doesn't want it to sit on the ground or on the ice and get cold. So he bounces on the feet, and then he has a little flap of skin that comes down and covers the egg, and then he stands there and protects it and keeps it warm until it hatches. No matter what happens, he has to be right there watching over that, that egg, keeping it safe and warm. Any guesses how long he has to stand there? Maybe a couple days? Maybe a week? Actually, he has to stand there 64 days. 64 days, that's over two months that he has to stand there and keep that egg warm and protect it. Now, father penguins lose a lot of weight during this time because they can't go off and find food to eat like they normally would. So they just stay right there. And uh, they probably get really hungry, and it's probably hard to stand there that whole time, but they do it because they love that chick, and they want to make sure that the egg is warm and safe and the chick will hatch soon. You know, as I read about that, I thought about all the many ways that our human fathers take good care of us and protect us and watch over us and teach us and care for us. There's many, many ways, and I hope today you'll have a chance to think about all those ways and that you will thank your father or grandfather or foster father or that man in your life who's like a father to you. That's why Father's Day was started, so we would have a day to celebrate. Father's Day started, the first Father's Day observance was in 1908, and it was started by a woman named Grace Clayton. And Grace Clayton had the idea that they should have a church service to honor fathers. Her father had died a few years before, and she knew of a lot of men who had passed away were great fathers, and a lot of men who were still living that she wanted to honor and celebrate. So she talked to her pastor at her church, and they had a church service honoring fathers. It was actually held on July 5th, 1908, at a Methodist church in West Virginia. It's interesting that the first Mother's Day service and the first Father's Day service were both held at two different Methodist churches in West Virginia. But after, every year after that, they've been celebrating Father's Day, so we can thank our fathers for all that they do. And today is a special time to thank our Heavenly Father as well. God is our Heavenly Father, and God protects us and helps us and teaches us and watches over us, and we want to thank God today too. In fact, let's do that together, shall we? Let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, let's fold our hands, and let's talk to God. Dear God, thank you for being our Heavenly Father and for caring for us and watching over us and teaching us and loving us. And thank you for our earthly fathers and grandfathers and foster fathers and those men in our lives who are like fathers to us and for all that they do for us. Sometimes it's not easy to be a father, and yet they, they give it their all and they work hard to help us, and we thank you for them. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's children said in a loud and mighty voice, Amen. And now here's Pastor Dale with today's prayer concerns. So this morning, I want to give you a promise from King David that was written in the 30th Psalm and the 5th verse. It is wisdom that can take us through any circumstance in life. And the words of David are simply these. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. It's been a long time getting through this time of the coronavirus. Next Sunday, we'll be back in church. And as time passes, we'll be completely over this. And even though morning may have been with us, joy will come. Let us bow our heads in prayer. And as we pray this morning, I want us to be remembering David Byers, Glory Storm, Sandy Nadaw, Bob Hasenjager, who lost his light wife, Mary Hasenjager, uh, just this week. Keep him in your prayers. Susan Howard, as she continues chemotherapy. Barb Morris, as her daughter Kim continues to recover at Edwin Shaw from a stroke. And Brad Pitt, who lost his wife of uh, over 60 years, Louise, uh, last week. Please keep these in your, these folks in your prayers as we bow our heads together. Let us pray. Living Lord, 
Grant that we might see the world as a mission field and ourselves as the ministers of your peace. May we have your eyes to see as you see, your hands to serve as you serve, and your feet to go where you would go. We confess that we have often been reluctant to speak up for your gospel, afraid that we might offend someone. Give us courage to take the chance that your Holy Spirit will enable us. You indeed promised your disciples that you would be with them and give them words to speak at the very time they would need them. We claim that promise for ourselves today, and so we go willingly into the world to witness for you. Protect us on the way. Send your peace with us so that every life we touch will know your presence. May those we encounter learn to say, The joy of the Lord is my strength, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the end, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in your name, the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I appreciate Pastor Dale's uh, prayer and uh, his leading us in that time. I just want to put in a promotion for our virtual choir. Uh, Alex Miller is one of the scouts from Troop 402, and his Eagle Scout project is uh, putting together a virtual choir. In just a moment, uh, you're going to see one of his first productions uh, as uh, some of our special music this morning. But he's got some other projects that he needs your help with, so I want to encourage you to, to visit his website. And there's a link, get started, uh, for his next project uh, as part of our virtual choir. So I encourage you to, uh, to help uh, Alex out in his endeavors to become an Eagle Scout. But at this time, uh, we're going to see uh, his first production of our virtual choir as they sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth.
that was just absolutely beautiful. And again, I encourage you uh, to uh, participate in our virtual choir. Before we go any further this morning, I'd like to pray. So I want to invite you to pray with me this morning and just invite you to open your heart to the leading of the Holy Spirit and to let the Spirit speak through God's Word to you today. Father, we pray that you open our eyes that we may see, that you open our hearts that we may receive, and that you open our understanding that we might do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, we're in this new series, Stuff My Church Does and Why. And you know, many times, even if you're not new to a church, you know, oftentimes you wonder uh, why churches do the things or repeat the things that they repeat, like the Apostles' Creed or, or the singing of the doxology, doxology, traditions that have really gone on for, for ages. And so this morning, we're going to look at why we need to study, why we need to read God's Word, the, the Scripture. You know, last week I told you that one of the reasons we gather is to, to define and to discover our greater purpose. Well, worship, the foundation for worship is God's Word. And so this morning I want to, 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 to put out there as my first point, every time we come together, we redefine our greater purpose by God's Word. And so this morning we're going to look at why is God's Word so crucial to everything that we are about as the people of God. You know, when I was in the third grade, I received my, my first Bible. You know, they put all the third grade Sunday school kids up on the front of the church like, like we do. And like most kids, I treasured my first Bible. I can still remember the feel and, and the smell of it. Uh, but I took it home and I put it under my nightstand. And I figured out pretty quick that it doesn't do you a lot of good if you just stick it under your nightstand. There's no magical blessing that you receive just because you own a Bible. You know, I've been in some homes where they'll have these beautiful, ornate family Bibles sitting on a, a coffee table, and I wonder, do they ever open it? Well, my first Bible went under my nightstand next to my bed, and that's pretty much where it stayed uh, for the next several years. And then I hit those turbulent teen years, you know, the ones I'm talking about. I was about 13 or 14 years old. I began to rebel and to question authority. For me, I, I got mad at God. I just didn't like the circumstances in my home and in my life, and I just I took it out on God. I pretty much told God to just to get lost. You know, God, I've got a plan for my life. It's probably better than yours. I was pursuing my own agenda. I was sort of taking uh, life into my own hands, trying to make my life work. But it wasn't. And so when it all kind of hit the fan, I guess you could say, I pulled out my third grade Bible from underneath my nightstand, and I began to read it. But I didn't just begin reading in Genesis like a lot of people do. For some reason, I began to read, to read the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And then I read Mark. And then I read Luke. And then John. And what I discovered from reading the Gospels was this irresistible attraction to this guy named Jesus. In fact, I didn't even know if Jesus was fact or, or, or fiction. I, I just... What I saw was that there was this, this guy who, who, who said stuff like, you know, if somebody smacks you on the right cheek, turn to them and let them hit you on the left. Said stuff like, love your enemy. You know, he was one of those people who couldn't tolerate religious people. In fact, there was a tension between the, the religious establishment and Jesus. And in fact, it was the religious establishment that wanted to put him to death. And I remember, as I read more and more of this, this Bible, I, I remember praying, I don't even know if you're a real God, but if you are, 
I need you in my life. And friends, that's when the transformation in my life began. It's the reason why I am standing before you as a pastor and a preacher. And where did I find it? I found it right here in this book. Because friends, God's Word has the power to transform lives forever. I heard our bishop, Tracy Malone, say in a sermon one time something that her father told her. She said her father said, don't just get into the Word, but let the Word get into you. Wise words. The book of 2 Timothy is one of the earliest writings in the New Testament. It was written about 40 years after Jesus resurrected and ascended into heaven. And what we see in this book are practices of the church that are well established just within a couple decades. Now, Timothy is a pastor. He, he's leading a church that Paul established in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. It was a very prominent city, a very large city. And after about three years, Paul appoints his young prodigy, Timothy, to lead this church. And so Paul writes to Timothy two letters from prison, probably facing his own execution, but still holding out hope. But he closes 1 Timothy with these words, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Now friends, if we did nothing else for the next 20 minutes or so, except just read verses of Scripture or have people come before you that we've videotaped reading their favorite verses, God could use that experience to move us and inspire us. Paul tells Timothy, keep the main thing the main thing. When you come together, Timothy, don't bring your political ideologies. People don't care about your opinions. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scriptures. And so what we see here, friends, is the Scriptures have always been the foundation of the church for faith and for practice and for the development of our character. And then Paul says, devote yourself to preaching. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scriptures and to preaching. That's what I'm doing right now. Preaching is just expounding and explaining what, what, scriptures, what the Scriptures mean. First we read, then we preach, and the third thing is teaching the Holy Scriptures. Now the reading of Scriptures is what we do when we come together. Preaching and expounding is what people like myself do. And then we teach. The teaching begins in the church, but hear me, it continues in our homes. Scriptures are meant to be the foundation of our family, our children, our faith, our practice, and the development of our character. That's why it says in Deuteronomy 11, Fix these words of mine, the Lord says, in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, all the time. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. The home is meant to be the primary place where the Scriptures are taught. Look at 2 Timothy 3.10. Paul writes, You, Timothy, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. What is he teaching? Paul's teaching the Holy Scriptures. And our way of life is developed on the basis of the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. We discover our purpose, our God calling, through the teachings of the Scripture. That's where we discover our life mission, our life work. That's where our faith is nurtured. 
And how is faith developed? It's developed through the teaching of the Holy Scripture. That's why every day it's not enough to just know the Scriptures. we got to live in the Scriptures to allow the Scriptures to live in us. And look what it says in verse 11. Look at that word, persecution. In fact, in verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you're, you're going to get hassled. If you're not being a bit harassed or hassled about your faith, maybe you need to take a good look at the kind of life you're living. Verse 13 continues, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, what, what has Timothy learned the Scriptures? But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And we discover from the book of Acts that Timothy learned about the faith from his mother and his grandfather. We don't know anything about Timothy's father, which is kind of sad on this Father's Day. Dads, you are meant to be the spiritual leader in your home. Look at verse 15, and how from infancy you have learned the Scriptures. Not from the time that you went to, to Sunday school or vacation Bible school, but from infancy. Susan and I used to read Scripture to our boys when they were still in the womb. From infancy you have learned the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. You do know the difference between knowledge and wisdom, don't you? See, knowledge is just knowing what the right thing is. Knowledge is understanding what is right, but if we live in the Word on a daily basis and allow the Word to live in us, then it makes us wise. Wisdom is the power to do the right thing. And Paul continues, verse 16, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all of God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, Scripture is the absolute core for the development of our faith and our character. And what is Scripture? Well, it's just God's story about Himself. God initiated that story through imperfect human beings, enlightened through His Holy Spirit. But it's God's story. Because from the beginning of time, people have been basically asking two questions. Is there a God? And where did all this come from? Where did all this creation come from? Moses. Moses asked God the same two basic questions. Remember, the first thing he asked God was, what's your name? In other words, God, what are you like? What kind of God are you? And remember what God said, I am who I am. In other words, Moses, don't try to figure me out. Don't try to put me in a box. I'm beyond explanation. I, I can't be confined by your finite thinking. Moses was just asking, who are you? And the second question Moses asked God was, show me your glory. Now, you have to understand, in the Hebrew, the original language of the Old Testament, glory literally just meant face. Paul says, what do you look like? Who are you? You know, any parent will know that when you look into the eyes of your child, you can usually tell right away if they're telling the truth or whether they're lying. And when you look into somebody's face intently, you're looking into their soul. You're looking into their character. Moses is really asking, what are you like? What kind of God are you? And friends, that's why we need to be in the Word every single day so we can understand more and more what this God is like that we serve. 
to be totally honest with you, you don't want to be around me if I've not been in the Word. You've heard it said before, or you heard me say it before, it only takes me about 24 hours to lose my fear of God. Scripture reminds me of who God is, that He is a holy God, that God has woven into the fabric of the universe moral laws and values. And that's why the psalmist says, your word is a light for my feet, a a light on my path. Man, I don't want to get off the path. And if we're not living in the Word and allowing the Word to live in us, then we start getting our values and our beliefs from other places. The the Ten Commandments remind us, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, you should have no greater passion than your love for God. And sadly, too many of us get more excited about cars or, or, or some hobby or golf or some sport than we do about the living God. And every time we deviate to the left or the right, it always leads to trouble. Trouble in our relationships, trouble in our marriage, trouble in our country, trouble in a whole generation. Moses' two basic questions are, is there a God and what is He like? And remember, God wouldn't allow Moses to see his face. He said, Moses, no one can look at me. No one can see my face and live. So what I'm going to do, Moses, I'm going to hide you in the cutout of the rock, and I'm going to pass by. And Moses gets to see God's backside. Ancient rabbis used to interpret that to mean to see where I've been. When you see the beauty of creation, it's like, wow, God, I have seen where you have been. Or when I see the look or the smile on my grandkids' faces, it amazes me that in just nine months, the complexity of a human being comes from just two tiny cells. I look at what God has created and I say, man, I see where you've been. God. And that's how Christianity is unique, friends, from all other religions. John writes in his gospel, the Word became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. See, friends, Moses didn't get to see God's face. But Paul writes in Colossians, the, the, son, the Son is the image of the invisible God, for God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. What's the age-old question? Is there a God? What does He look like? Answer, He looks like Jesus. That's who God is. And so I know that that, that God is not a condemning judge. He's my loving Heavenly Father. And I know that He is loving and He is gracious. And Jesus tells stories to help us understand what God is like. Stories like the lost sheep. Stories like the lost coin. Stories like the lost son. That even when we're lost, even when we can't figure out our own way, God pursues us and seeks us. And He loves the whole world. Not just some people, not just certain ethnic groups. Doesn't love men more than He does women. Doesn't love Republicans and Independents more than Democrats. Doesn't love Christians more than atheists. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to eternal life. God is so serious about all people being His children that He's willing to sit down and have dinner with prostitutes and drunks. My grandma Ebert used to babysit me before I was old enough to to go to school. There weren't daycares and and, and preschools in, in those days, but my grandma Ebert always used to make me eat beets. But she also helped me to memorize John 
3.16. I haven't touched a beat since my grandma Ebert stopped babysitting me at the age of four or five. But I still remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I got six years of theological education. I've got two master's degrees in theology, one of them from the seminary out in Princeton. And like so many others have said before me, the most profound truth that I've ever learned, I ever heard, is simply this Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible. The Bible tells me so. Friends, it's absolutely essential that I don't just know the Word, but I allow the Word to live in me each and every day. See, the more I discover about God's story and who God is, the more I discover about my own story. Because God's story helps me understand my story. But God's story also tells me that I have a problem. And it's a serious problem. It says that I'm infected with a disease. In fact, we are all infected with the disease. We are all carriers of this disease. And that disease is called sin. And sin isn't just bad behavior. Sin is a condition. So the Bible says that none of us are righteous, not even one. Therefore, we don't have the right to judge another person. Jesus used an almost comical illustration. He, he said to, to get the log out of your own eye. How do you get a log in your own eye? But that's the sort of the hyperbole. He said, get the log out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in your brother or sister's eye. And that's why you're never going to hear me beat up on someone or some people group from up here. I got too much of my own stuff to deal with than to, to worry about others. And the scriptures are pretty clear. The scriptures are pretty clear. There's only one cure for the disease of sin, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. Friends, it, it's a mystery to me, but what we need in our life is what God has done through Jesus on the cross. And the Scripture reminds me that I have to start each day at the foot of the cross. I have to commit myself to following Jesus in the way of the cross. Unless I'm living in the Scriptures, and the Scriptures are living in me, then I miss the mark. Let me just share a couple more verses with you before I finish from Colossians chapter 2. Paul writes, When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your, your flesh, that's that, that sin condition, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And so if you're sitting out there today thinking that you're beyond redeeming, that you are beyond the grace of God, that you are beyond salvation, friends, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. He forgave us all of our sins, nailing them to the cross. So read your Bibles. Read your Bibles. Be in God's Word so God's Word is in you. You know, for the last 30 years or so, Susan and I have been serving churches all over this state. And one thing I've noticed is a loss of passion for the Word of God. You know, when we were younger, whenever we went to church, you know, we carried our Bibles. I bet some of you can remember when you used to, to bring your Bibles to church, but you don't anymore. What's happened? Have we lost our first love? 
And if we have, how do we, how do we regain? How do we recapture our first love? Well, we live in the Scriptures and we allow the Scriptures to live in us. God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your living Word in Jesus Christ. Thank You for Your Holy Spirit that fills us and gives us the power to not just know the right thing, but to do the right thing. So, Father, help us to be in Your Word. Help us to to be diligent students of Your Holy Word that we might be Your holy people in this world. And that's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, our praise band, they're going to lead us in the singing of I Will Follow. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Again, hope this online service has been a blessing to you, friends. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, if you haven't already, please take our Google survey uh, regarding our in-person worship service starting up next Sunday at 10 a.m. And uh, get plugged into our virtual choir. But again, thank you for joining us uh, again this week. So may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you and abide with you always. Amen.